Hello and welcome to True Crime Case Files. This show deals with violent and often disturbing crimes committed against men, women and children. Some material may not be suitable for all audiences. Therefore, listener discretion is strongly advised. Madeline Beth McCann is a British citizen who went missing at the age of three. The incident occurred on the evening of May 3, 2007, when she disappeared from her bed in a holiday apartment in Priya da Luz, Lagos, Portugal. This case has been widely reported and is considered one of the most extensively covered missing person cases in modern history, according to the Daily Telegraph. At the time of her disappearance, Madeline was on vacation with her parents, Kate and Jerry McCann, her twin siblings who were two years old, and a group of family friends with their children. While her parents were dining with friends at a restaurant 55 meters away, the McCann children were left asleep in the ground floor apartment. Throughout the evening, the parents checked on their children until Kate realized that Madeline was missing at 10 p.m. In the following weeks, the Portuguese police developed a belief, fueled by misinterpretation of a British DNA analysis, that Madeline had died in an accident in the apartment and that her parents had concealed it. Consequently, the McCanns were labeled as suspects in their own daughter's disappearance in September 2007. However, in July 2008, the case was archived due to insufficient evidence leading to the removal of their suspect status. Despite the case being closed, Madeline's parents continued their own investigation with the help of private detectives. In 2011, Scotland Yard initiated its own inquiry, known as Operation Grange. The senior investigating officer treated the disappearance as a criminal act committed by a stranger, possibly an abduction or a failed burglary. In 2013, Scotland Yard released eFit images of men they wished to locate including one individual seen carrying a child towards the beach on the night Madeline vanished. Subsequently, the Portuguese police reopened their inquiry. Although Operation Grange was scaled back in 2015, a small number of significant inquiries were still pursued by the remaining detectives in April 2017. In June 2020, German authorities named Christian Bruckner as their primary suspect in the abduction and murder of McCann. However, formal charges have yet to be filed. The disappearance of Madeleine garnered extensive media coverage both in the United Kingdom and internationally, drawing comparisons to the media frenzy surrounding the death of Diana, Princess of Wales, in 1997. Madeleine's parents faced intense scrutiny and unfounded allegations regarding their involvement in her death, particularly from tabloid newspapers and on social media platforms like Twitter. In 2008, they and their companions received apologies and damages from Express newspapers. Additionally, in 2011, the McCanns provided testimony at the Leveson Inquiry, which aimed to address issues of misconduct within the British press and advocated for stricter press regulations. Born in Leicester, Madeleine McCann lived with her family in Rothley, Leicestershire. Following her disappearance, her parents requested that she be made a ward of court in England, granting the court the power to act on her behalf. Described by the police as having blonde hair, blue-green eyes, a small brown spot on her left calf, and a distinctive dark strip on the iris of her right eye. Madeline's appearance was age-progressed in 2009 and 2012. Both of Madeline's parents are physicians and practicing Roman Catholics. Kate Marie McCann, formerly known as Kate Healy, attended All Saints School and Notre Dame High School before obtaining a degree in medicine from the University of Dundee. She pursued a career in obstetrics, gynecology, anesthetics, and general practice. Gerald Patrick McCann attended Holyrood RC Secondary School and graduated with a BSc in Physiology and Sports Science from the University of Glasgow. He later obtained his MD and became a consultant cardiologist at Glenfield Hospital in Leicester. The couple met in Glasgow in 1993, got married in 1998, and had three children together. During their holiday in Praia da Luz, Portugal, the McCanns were accompanied by seven friends and a total of eight children, including their own three. The group of adults often dined together in the resort's Tapas restaurant, earning them the nickname Tapas Seven in the media. One member of the group, Jane Tanner, claimed to have seen a man carrying a child away from the resort shortly before Madeline's disappearance, which became a significant aspect of the case. Staying in a privately owned apartment located at 5 Rua Drive, Agostinho da Silva, the McCann's accommodation was part of Mark Warner's Ocean Club Resort. The apartment had two bedrooms and was located on the ground floor. It had sliding glass patio doors that overlooked the resort's amenities. 
The McCann children slept in a bedroom next to the front door, which remained locked throughout their stay. Madeline slept in a single bed opposite the window, while the twins slept in travel cots in the middle of the room. On May 3rd, the second to last day of their holiday, Madeline asked her parents why they didn't come when she and her brother cried the previous night. Her mother also noticed a large brown stain on Madeline's pyjama top. The family spent the morning at the resort's kids club, had lunch at their apartment and went to the pool. Kate took a photograph of Madeline sitting by the pool that afternoon. Later in the day, the children returned to the kids club and their mother took them back to the apartment while their father went for a tennis lesson. The children were put to bed around 7pm, with Madeline wearing pink and white Eeyore pyjamas from Marks and Spencer accompanied by her comfort blanket and a soft toy named Cuddle Cat. At 8.30pm, all the parents decided to have dinner with their friends at the Ocean Club's Tapas restaurant, which was located on the opposite side of the pool. Although the restaurant was only about 55 metres away from their apartment, reaching it required walking along a public street, entering the Ocean Club resort and making their way to the other side of the pool, covering a distance of approximately 82 metres. From the restaurant, they could see the top of their apartment, but not the doors. To ensure easy access when checking on their children, the McCanns left the patio doors closed but unlocked with the curtains drawn. There was a child safety gate at the top of the patio steps and a low gate at the bottom leading to the street. The staff at the resort had received a note requesting the same table to be reserved for the McCanns and their friends every evening at 8.30pm for the past four nights. The table overlooked the apartments, and the note mentioned that the children were asleep in the apartments. Kate suspected that the abductor might have seen this note. Throughout the evening, the McCanns and their friends would leave the restaurant every half hour to check on their children. Jerry was the first to check on the apartment at around 9.05 p.m. The children were sleeping peacefully, except for the fact that he noticed the bedroom door, which he had left slightly ajar, was now almost wide open. He closed it almost completely before returning to the restaurant. One of the Tuppers Seven, Jane Tanner, had a significant sighting that night, which became a crucial part of the early investigation. Tanner had left the restaurant shortly after 9pm to check on her own daughter. On her way back to the restaurant, she passed Jerry, who was returning from his 9.05pm check. Jerry had stopped to talk to another British holidaymaker, but neither of them recalled seeing Tanner. This raised suspicion from the Portuguese police, considering the narrowness of the street, and they accused Tanner of fabricating the sighting. Tanner informed the police that around 9.15pm, she noticed a man carrying a young child crossing the junction, just ahead of her. The man was heading east, away from the front of apartment 5, not far from Madeline's bedroom. The child in his arms was wearing light-coloured pink pyjamas with a floral pattern, similar to Madeline's. Tanner described the man as white, dark-haired, approximately 5 feet 7 inches tall, with a southern European or Mediterranean appearance, aged between 35 and 40 years old, wearing gold or beige trousers and a dark jacket. He did not look like a tourist. Tanner immediately shared this information with the Portuguese police as soon as Madeline was reported missing, but it was not made public until May 25th. Madeline's fund commissioned a forensic artist to create an image of the man, which was released in October 2007. This sighting provided investigators with a time frame for the abduction, but Scotland Yard eventually considered it a misleading clue. In October 2013, they identified a British holiday maker as the man Tanner had seen. He had been returning to his apartment after picking up his daughter from the Ocean Club night crash. Scotland Yard took photographs of the man wearing similar clothes to those described by Tanner and in a similar pose. The pyjamas worn by his daughter also matched Tanner's report. Detective Chief Inspector Andy Redwood, the lead detective of Operation Grange, stated that they were almost certain the Tanner sighting was unrelated to the abduction. The dismissal of the Tanner sighting as significant to the timeline allowed investigators to shift their focus to another sighting reported by Martin and Mary Smith, who were on vacation in Praia da Luz from Ireland. The Smiths saw a man carrying a child on the night of Madeline's disappearance, approximately at 10 p.m. The man was walking away from the Ocean Club towards the beach, about 500 yards from the McCann's apartment. The child he was carrying was a girl, around three or four years old, with blonde hair and pale skin. She was wearing light-colored pajamas and had bare feet. The man was described as being in his mid-thirties, with a height between 5 feet 7 inches and 5 feet 9 inches, 
and a slim to normal build. He had short brown hair and was wearing cream or beige trousers. The Smiths noted that he did not look like a tourist and appeared uncomfortable carrying the child. EFITs based on the Smiths' testimony were created in 2008 and later publicised by Scotland Yard in 2013. On the night of Madeline's disappearance, Kate had intended to check on the children at 9.30pm, but Matthew Oldfield, one of the toughest seven, offered to do it when he checked on his own children in the adjacent apartment. However, he did not look far enough into the bedroom to see if Madeline was there. Kate made her own check at around 10 p.m. and Scotland Yard concluded that Madeline was likely taken moments before this. Kate entered the apartment through the unlocked patio doors and noticed that the children's bedroom door was wide open. When she tried to close it, she felt a draft and saw that the bedroom window and its shutter were open. Madeline's belongings were still in the room, but she was missing. Kate ran back towards the restaurant, screaming that Madeline was gone and someone had taken her. Jerry sent Matthew Oldfield to ask the resort's reception desk to call the police at around 10.10pm, and the resort activated its missing child search protocol at 10.30pm. 60 staff and guests searched until 4.30 the next morning, initially assuming that Madeline had wandered off. Two officers from the Garda National Republicana arrived at the resort at 11.10pm, followed by the Polisha Judiciaria at around 1am. Search and rescue dogs were brought in at 8am and police officers started searching various areas around Praia da Luz. However, mistakes were made during the initial hours after the disappearance, including delays in providing descriptions of Madeline to border and marine police and the failure to conduct house-to-house -house searches. Interpol also took five days to issue a global missing person alert. The crime scene was not properly secured, and samples were taken from Madeline's bedroom, but around 20 people had entered the apartment before it was closed off. The apartment remained empty for a month after the disappearance before being sealed off for further forensic tests. Similar mishandling occurred outside the apartment, where evidence may have been trampled on by a crowd gathered near the front door and the children's bedroom window. The British response to the case was coordinated by Leicestershire Police, although it remained a Portuguese inquiry. The presence of British police was resented by the Portuguese police, who felt condescended to and believed the British were acting as a colonial power. The media attention surrounding Madeline's disappearance led to the arrival of numerous public relations consultants, which were seen as counterproductive by the local police. The McCanns set up Madeline's fund to raise money and awareness, and their PR team organized events and trips to sustain media interest in the case. Madeline appeared on the front page of British newspapers and was featured in magazines and news channels. However, concerns were raised about the professionalism and exploitation of the media coverage. The Portuguese tabloid Correio da Manha published numerous articles about Madeline, and her name generated thousands of videos and posts on YouTube and social media platforms. Twelve days elapsed following Madeline's disappearance when Robert Murat, a 34-year-old British Portuguese property consultant, became the primary suspect in the case. Born in Hammersmith, West London, Murat resided in his mother's house, Casa Liliana, which was located just 150 yards away from apartment 5 the same direction the man in the Tanner siding had walked. The suspicion surrounding Murat arose after a journalist from the Sunday Mirror informed the Portuguese police that he had been inquiring about the case. Initially, Murat had been enlisted as an official interpreter by the PJ, stating that he wanted to assist because he had a daughter in England who was around the same age as Madeline. Several individuals, including three members of the Tapas Seven, an Ocean Club nanny, and two British holidaymakers, claimed to have seen Murat near apartment 5 shortly after the disappearance. However, Murat and his mother maintained that he had been at home throughout the entire evening. The McCann Circle harboured doubts about Murat, as one of their supporters offered exclusive access to new developments in the case to a BBC reporter in exchange for information on what the press pack was saying about Murat. Starting on May 15, 2007, Murat's residence underwent a thorough search including the draining of the pool, examination of his cars, computers, phones and videotapes, as well as a ground radar and sniffer dog search of his garden. Additionally, two of Murat's associates were questioned. In March 2008, one of these associates had their car set on fire, with the word Fala spray painted in red on the pavement. Despite the extensive investigation, there was no evidence linking Murat or his friends to Madeline's disappearance. Consequently, Murat's status as a suspect was lifted on July 21, 2008, 
when the case was archived. In April that year, Murat received $600,000 in out-of-court settlements for libel, marking the highest number of separate libel actions brought by a single individual in the UK regarding one issue. His friends also received $100,000 each. During Operation Grange in July 2014, one of Murat's friends was questioned again as a witness, this time by the PJ on behalf of Scotland Yard. In December of the same year, both Murat and his wife were questioned, along with eight others, also on behalf of Scotland Yard. In 2017, Murat's mother came forward as a witness, recounting suspicious events she had observed near apartment 5 on the night of the disappearance. She claimed to have seen a young woman in a plum-coloured top acting suspiciously outside the apartment, as well as a small brown rental car speeding towards the apartment in the wrong direction on a one-way street. Witness statements provided to the PJ described men exhibiting peculiar behaviour near apartment 5 in the days leading up to the disappearance and on the day itself. Scotland Yard speculated that these men might have been conducting surveillance for a potential abduction or burglary. The number of burglaries had increased fourfold between January and May 2007, with two occurring in the McCann's block in the 17 days prior to Madeline's disappearance, both involving entry through windows. Multiple witnesses reported encounters with men soliciting donations for charity. On April 20th, a disheveled man approached a tourist in her apartment, requesting money for an orphanage in nearby Aspitch. However, there were no orphanages or similar establishments in or near Aspitch at the time. The witness described the man as pushy and intimidating. On either April 25th or 26th, the previous tenant of apartment 5 encountered a man on his balcony who had gained access through the steps from the street. Polite and clean-shaven, the visitor asked for money for an orphanage. On May 3rd, the day of the disappearance, there were four instances of charity collections by two men in the vicinity of apartment 5. At 4 p.m., two black-haired men approached a British homeowner seeking funds for a hostel or hospice in or near a spitch. At 5 p.m., two men approached another British tourist with a similar story. What was described as an ugly, blonde-haired man was spotted on May 2nd across the road from where the McCanns were staying, seemingly observing the apartment. He had also been seen near the Ocean Club on April 29th. On April 30th, the granddaughter of the former owners of apartment 5 witnessed a blonde-haired man leaning against a wall behind the apartments. She encountered him again on May 2nd near the Tuppers restaurant, where he was looking at the apartment. She described him as Caucasian in his mid-30s, with short cropped hair, and ugly with spots. On or before the day of the disappearance, a man was observed staring at the McCann's block, where a white van was parked. In the late afternoon of May 3rd, a girl on the balcony of the apartment above 5 witnessed a man exiting through the gate below, as if he had come from a ground-floor apartment. She found it peculiar that he looked around before quietly closing the gate with both hands. At 2.30pm, two blonde-haired men were seen on the balcony of 5C, an unoccupied apartment two doors away from the McCann's. Between 4 and 5 p.m., a blonde-haired man was spotted near the apartment. At 6 p.m., the same blonde-haired man or another one was observed in the stairwell of the McCann's block. At 11 p.m., after the disappearance, two blonde-haired men were witnessed in a nearby street speaking loudly. Upon realizing they had been noticed, they lowered their voices and walked away. The initial sign that the media were turning against the McCann's emerged on June 6, 2007 when a German journalist questioned their involvement in the disappearance during a press conference in Berlin. This was followed by a 3,000-word article in a Portuguese weekly publication called Sol, titled The Madeleine Case, A Pact of Silence, which accused the McCanns of being suspects and pointed out alleged inconsistencies in their statements. The article also suggested that the Tanner sighting had been fabricated. It was clear that there was a leak within the investigation, as the reporters had obtained the mobile numbers of the Tupper 7 and another witness. These articles, along with subsequent ones in the Portuguese and UK press, made baseless allegations that would haunt the McCanns on social media for years to come. Some of these allegations included claims that the McCanns and Tupper 7 were involved in swinging, that the McCanns had been drugging their children, and that there was a pact of silence among the group regarding the events of the night of the disappearance. The media also focused on inconsistencies in the statements given by the McCanns and the Tapas 7. The police had conducted the interviews in Portuguese, which were then translated into English for the interviewees to sign. 
Among the inconsistencies was the question of whether the McCanns had entered the apartment through the front or back door when checking on the children. Jerry initially stated that they had used the front door, but later claimed they had used the unlocked patio doors at the back. There was also confusion about whether the front door had been locked. The police questioned why Kate had left the twins alone in the apartment and ran to the Tapas restaurant when she discovered Madeline was missing, instead of using her mobile phone or calling for help from the rear balcony. Another point of contention was whether the exterior shutter over Madeline's bedroom window could be opened from the outside. Kate claimed the shutter and window were closed when Madeline was put to bed, but open when she realized Madeline was gone. Jerry, on the other hand, said he had closed the shutter and discovered it could only be raised from the outside. The police argued that the shutter could not be opened from the outside without force, but there were no signs of forced entry. These discrepancies led the Portuguese police to doubt the abduction theory. Kate's cry of, they've taken her, was seen as suspicious, as if she was trying to support a false abduction story. As time went on, suspicions grew that Madeline had died in the apartment as a result of an accident, possibly after being sedated, and that her parents had concealed her body for a month before disposing of it in a hired car. In 2010, Carlos Anjos, former head of the Police Detectives Union in Portugal, stated that most Portuguese investigators still believed Madeline had died as a result of an accident in the apartment. On June 28, 2007, the McCanns suggested to the police that they seek assistance from a South African former police officer named Danny Krugel, who claimed to have a device that could locate missing people using DNA and satellites. The police interpreted Kate's support of Krugel as a tactic to disclose the location of her daughter's body without implicating herself. As a result, they sent a letter to the British police requesting assistance in their search for Madeline's body. Mark Harrison, the National Search Advisor for the NPIA, arrived in Praia da Luz to conduct a search. He dismissed Krugel's ideas as highly unlikely and recommended searching various locations, including the beach wasteland, the McCann's rented house, and the Tapas Seven's apartments. He also suggested using sniffer dogs, including one trained to detect human blood and another trained to detect human cadavers. The sniffer dogs were brought in and alerted behind the sofa in the living room of apartment 5A, as well as near the wardrobe in the main bedroom. However, there were no alerts on the beach or wasteland. The police obtained warrants to search the McCann's rented house and the car they had hired, and the dogs alerted to the scent of cadavers in the car. The media immediately began reporting that Madeline had died in apartment 5. Hair and other fibers were gathered from various locations in the car and apartment 5 where Keela and Eddie had indicated potential evidence. These samples were then sent to the Forensic Science Service in Birmingham for DNA profiling, arriving in early August 2007. The Sunday Times reported that at this stage, the PJ had abandoned the theory of abduction. On August 8, before receiving the results from Birmingham, the Portuguese police summoned the McCanns to a meeting in Portimao. During this meeting, Gilhermino Encarnação, the PJ Regional Director, and Luis Neves, coordinator of the Dioxal Central de Combate ao Banditismo in Lisbon, informed the McCanns that the case was now being treated as a murder investigation. It is worth noting that when Encarnação passed away in 2010, the Daily Telegraph identified him as a significant source of leaks against the McCanns. Both Kate and Jerry were interrogated that day, with the officers suggesting that Kate's memory was unreliable. The FSS utilized a technique called low-copy number testing to analyze the DNA samples. This method is controversial due to its susceptibility to contamination and misinterpretation, especially when only a few cells are available. In an email sent on September 3rd, John Lowe from the FSS informed Detective Superintendent Stuart Pryor of the Leicestershire Police that a sample from the car boot contained 15 out of 19 DNA components matching Madeline's profile. However, Lowe stated that the result was too complex to provide a meaningful interpretation, as it appeared to have originated from at least three individuals. The email emphasized the uncertainty of whether the match was genuine or a chance occurrence. Following the translation of Lowe's email into Portuguese on September 4, Kate claims that the PJ proposed a deal during a subsequent meeting. They suggested that if she admitted that Madeline had died accidentally in the apartment, and that she had concealed the body, she would only serve a two-year sentence. In return, her husband would not be charged and would be free to leave. On September 7th, both Kate and Jerry were officially named Argidos, 
or suspects and were advised by their lawyer not to answer any further questions. The PJ informed Jerry that Madeline's DNA had been found in the car boot and behind the sofa in apartment 5A. While Jerry did respond to questioning, Kate declined to answer 48 questions during an 11-hour interview. The DNA evidence was reported to be a 100% match by Portuguese journalists. British tabloids ran headlines such as Corpse and McCann Car and claimed that a clump of Maddie's hair had been discovered in the vehicle. These leaks were attributed to the Portuguese police as testified by Jerry Lawton, a Daily Star reporter, during the Leveson inquiry in 2012. Matt Bagot of the Leicestershire Police stated that his decision not to correct the reporters was based on the fact that the Portuguese authorities were leading the investigation and his priority was to maintain a positive relationship with the PJ to aid in finding Madeline. Despite being named Argaidos, the McCanns were permitted to leave Portugal and return to England on September 9, following legal advice. The next day, Chief Inspector Tavares de Almeida of the PJ in Portimao compiled a nine-page report concluding that Madeline had died in apartment 5A as a result of an accident. The report also alleged that the restaurant meal and apparent checks on the McCann children were part of a cover-up and that the Tapa 7 had assisted in misleading the police. It further claimed that the McCanns had concealed Madeline's body before staging an abduction. An 11-page document from the Information Analysis Brigade in Lisbon analysed alleged inconsistencies in the McCann statements. On September 11th, the public prosecutor handed the 10-volume case file to Judge Pedro Miguel dos Anjos Frias, who subsequently granted an application to seize Kate's diary and Jerry's laptop. The police also sought to trace telephone calls between the McCanns and the Tupper 7, as well as details about the number of suitcases taken back to England. According to a leaked diplomatic cable, the United States ambassador to Portugal, Al Hoffman, revealed that the British police had developed the current evidence against the McCann parents during a meeting with the British ambassador to Portugal, Alexander Ellis. Hoffman emphasized that both countries were cooperating and stated that media attention was expected and acceptable as long as government officials refrained from public comments. A British security company funded by an anonymous donor since May 7, 2007, collected hair samples from the McCann twins on September 24, 2007, at the request of their parents. The twins had slept through the commotion in apartment 5A when Madeline was reported missing, and there were concerns that the abductor might have given them sedatives. Kate had previously requested the samples to be taken three months after the disappearance, but it had not been done. A sample was also taken from Kate to disprove allegations that she was on medication, and no traces of drugs were found. Chief Inspector Gonsalo Amaral was removed from his position as the coordinator of the inquiry on October 2nd and transferred to Faro after he made comments to the newspaper Diario de Noticias, criticizing the British police's handling of the case. He accused them of only pursuing leads that were helpful to the McCanns. One example he mentioned was their decision to follow up on an anonymous email to Prince Charles that claimed a former Ocean Club employee had taken Madeline. Amaral himself became a suspect in another case, the disappearance of Jonah Cipriano, one day after Madeline went missing. He was later charged with making a false statement, while four other officers were charged with assault. Jonah Cipriano had disappeared in 2004, and her body was never found. Her mother and uncle were convicted of her murder, but the mother retracted her confession, alleging that she had been beaten by the police. Amaral was accused of covering up for others involved in the beating, although he was not present when it occurred. He was convicted of perjury in May 2009. The McCann inquiry was taken over by Paulo Rubailo, the deputy national director of the PJ, who expanded the team of detectives and initiated a case review. In November 2007, four members of the Portuguese inquiry were briefed by the FSS at Leicestershire Police Headquarters. The Tupper Seven were interviewed in England by the Leicestershire Police in April 2008, with the PJ present. The PJ had planned to hold a reconstruction in Praia da Luz in December 2007, using the McCanns and Tupper 7, but the Tupper 7 declined to participate. The relationship between the McCanns and the Portuguese police deteriorated further that month when transcripts of their interviews with the PJ were leaked to Spanish television. The national director of the PJ, Alipia Ribeiro, resigned shortly after, citing media pressure. Portuguese prosecutors were examining several charges against the McCanns, including child abandonment, abduction, homicide, and concealment of a corpse as of May 2008. 
On July 21, 2008, the Portuguese Attorney General announced that there was no evidence linking the McCanns or Robert Murat to Madeleine's disappearance. Their status as suspects was lifted and the case was closed. In August, Portugal's Ministerio Publico released case files to the media, including a prosecutor's report that concluded there was no element of proof to form any conclusion about the circumstances. Amaral resigned from the force in June 2008 and wrote a book alleging that Madeleine had died in an accident and the McCanns had faked an abduction. The McCanns initiated a libel action against Amaral and his publisher in 2009. They were awarded over $600,000 in damages in 2015, but Amaral's appeal succeeded in 2016. The ban on his book was lifted, but the McCanns appealed to Portugal's Supreme Court, which ruled against them in February 2017. In March, the Supreme Court rejected their final appeal. The McCanns set up Madeleine's Fund in May 2007, and it received significant support and donations from the public and public figures. They hired several firms of private investigators, causing tension with the Portuguese police. Oakley International, a detective agency, was hired in 2008 and conducted undercover operations within the Ocean Club and among paedophile rings and the Roma community. The relationship between Oakley and the fund soured, and the agency's report suggested that Madeleine may have died in an accident and the McCanns had covered it up. Scotland Yard launched Operation Grange in May 2011, which was an investigative review of the case. The team investigated various theories, including a planned abduction, a burglary gone wrong, and Madeleine wandering off. They also tracked mobile phone calls made near the scene of the disappearance and interviewed several individuals. The investigation is ongoing and funding has been extended multiple times. Scotland Yard released another appeal in March 2014 seeking information about a man who had committed a series of sexual assaults in holiday homes in the Algarve region of Portugal between 2004 and 2006. The man targeted British families, specifically young girls ages 7 to 10, and spoke English with a foreign accent. He had distinct physical features, including short, dark, unkempt hair and tanned skin. The appeal also mentioned that he may have worn a long-sleeved burgundy top with a white circle on the back. These incidents were part of a larger pattern of 12 reported incidents in the area between 2004 and 2010. In an effort to gather more information, Scotland Yard and the Portuguese police conducted searches and interviews in Praia da Luz, the town where the infamous disappearance of Madeleine McCann occurred. They searched drains and a large area of wasteland, but found no evidence. Interviews were conducted with four Portuguese citizens, but no evidence was found to implicate them. Additional interviews were conducted in December 2014, including individuals associated with Robert Murat, the first Argaido in the case. However, none of the interviewees admitted to being involved in Madeleine's disappearance. In 2020, German prosecutors announced that they had concrete evidence linking Christian Bruckner to the abduction and murder of Madeleine McCann. Bruckner, who had a criminal record for child sexual abuse and drug trafficking, was serving a prison sentence in Germany for raping a 72-year-old woman in the Algarve region. The formal charges against him have been delayed due to confusion over which German court is responsible for the trial. German investigators believe that Bruckner may have killed Madeleine near a dam in the Algarve region and disposed of her body in the water. Throughout the investigation, various individuals have been considered as potential suspects including British paedophiles and individuals with connections to other child abduction cases. The McCanns and the Tapas Seven, a group of friends who were with the McCanns on the night of Madeleine's disappearance, have pursued legal action against several newspapers for libel. A Netflix documentary series titled The Disappearance of Madeleine McCann was released in 2019, featuring interviews with key individuals involved in the case. The McCann family did not support the production of the documentary. To date, the whereabouts of Madeleine McCann are still unknown.